Hey, please welcome to the table for the first time, Ryan McNeil. All right, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I, in, in thinking about what I wanted to talk about, um, I think oftentimes, uh, especially at the, like, these sort of like technical get togethers, it ends up being a lot of technical information. Um, and especially in, in the realm of color grading, because it is so very technical, most of the discussions I see online and in person have to do with the technical side. So I wanted to offer something that was a little bit more counter-programmed to like the art and get back to the art of it. Um, and, and like he was saying, my background is, um, I come from traditional oil painting and Photoshop. I'm also an amateur film photographer. I do my own darkroom photography and all those things like aid and inform me as an artist. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna to talk to you about the emotional arc of color. Um, color is deeply coded into our emotions. I think like you know, all of us have had some visceral experience like being in a place where there's an overwhelming color that you either enjoy or you dislike. You know, if it's like the office place where you have fluorescent lighting that you know, beats you down all day while you're trying to work in a cubicle or like a nice restaurant that's got a bright red wall that just makes you feel warm and welcomed. Um, color is a powerful tool and um, the art of color grading is very much an art. Uh, in a well-graded film, uh, the color story subtly shapes the emotional response of the audience. Um, and it takes them on a journey through the character's internal world. As filmmakers, we can't tell the audience what a character is feeling, but we can indirectly influence the audience through color. Um, and I, uh, another way to describe this is I usually compare uh, color to film score. It's not something that everyone notices while they're watching a film. You feel the score, and you know, particularly good scores, you remember the melodies, but whether or not you're paying attention to the film score, it's affecting you and it makes you feel a certain way. Color is exactly the same, it's just a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum and the same you know, principles of science and art that govern music govern color. Um, so color paints the internal world of the film and its characters. Uh, you can think of it as a way of seeing characters' emotions on screen and visualized. Um, so I'm going to take you through some like popular examples. Um, the Matrix. Uh, in the Matrix, the simulated world that Neo and his um, you know co cohorts are navigating through, uh, it's predominantly green. We all remember that. That's an easy easy go to. Uh, this green creates a sense of discomfort and the idea that something isn't quite right. The real world, however, is contrasted with blue hues, rendering the highlights and the skin tones more neutral. It's a little hard to tell in this, um, on this projector here, but the two on the right are blue, and the two on the left are green. <laughs> um, these grading choices are not literal to what the characters see. At no point in the film does Neo say, oh, I notice in the real world everything's blue, or no, ah, everything in the Matrix is green, I see now. Uh, that's not a literal experience the characters are having. It's not diegetic. Um, this exists for the audience to feel the difference between the two worlds, um, and it illustrates perhaps how Neo feels as a master of both. Um, and I think particularly in genre films, color grading really does serve a purpose in informing the audience what this world is like. It's the continuity of the world. It's the feeling of the world. Um, and, the and the Matrix in particular has a strong memorable look. Um, there's arguably no film in cinema history as well known for its transportive color story than The Wizard of Oz. Uh, taking an audience that was very much used to black and white film and transporting them into a magical world unlike anything they've ever seen before. I would love to be able to uh, be an older person, go back to that time and experience what that was like, because I'm sure it was amazing. It was probably a, more, a better experience than the first Avatar. <laughs> um, but it was a great moment for technology and storytelling combined, and it will be hard-pressed to have something like that again. Um, 
once again, the two worlds in this film um, are represented uh, with two different color palettes, one black and white and one in color. And that's not literal. Uh, you know, Dorothy doesn't see black and white, nor does she comment on it. And then when she's transported into the land of Oz, she doesn't comment on, like, you know, seeing color for the first time. It only serves as a visual metaphor for the audience to experience the leap um, between realities with Dorothy. So again, it's just to show and illustrate the internal world of the character. Um, and you know, the land of Oz is truly a fantastical place. Um, okay, and uh, here a more recent um, example. Uh, Asteroid City is a love letter to 1950s, like Route 66, um, you know, Middle America or Western. Um, the color grading here is a very intentional control over the entire palette and contrast to evoke the feeling of vintage 50s uh, photography and commercial illustration. None of the colors exist in a real way. Uh, they exist as part of a specific palette um, that, that we all associate with a uh, you know, a real time and place. Um, the goal of the color story here, or the goal of the color story here is to transport us to that time in that world. Um, and it, re it reminds me of something I, I learned from another color, Sad Company 3, it was like, color grading is not about realism, it's about believability um, and manipulating the audience to believe something that isn't real. Uh, another example is you know, uh, one of my favorites from last year. Everything, everywhere, all at once uh, relies really heavily on color to inform the audience which reality Evel Evelyn is experiencing. Uh, if you haven't seen this film yet, I, I hope I'm not spoiling anything here, but you should see it. Uh, Evelyn, the main character, is transported through multiple different universes and realities. And to help the audience keep those all on track, we have very different looks for each of them so that later in the movie we can flick between them very quickly and the audience will understand what Evelyn is experiencing as her consciousness transcends universes. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, in this example here, you can see like in the top, top left, the, the IRS office, which is a space that we're in for a large part of the movie, is bright, fluorescent, uninviting. There's green tones playing in the shadows that kind of um, foreshadow what's to come. Uh, whenever Evelyn is in danger, either physical or emotional danger, the filmmakers use dark green coloring in the shadows and midtones to you know, hit home that this is, you know, um, you know, in, uh, an endangering experience for her. Uh, the most warm and pleasant colors come when Evelyn feels the most realized, either how she wishes she was or later when she accepts who she is. Uh, and again, none of the color grades here are true or real, but they are a visual rep or a visual manifestation of Evelyn's experience, and it's believable from an audience perspective. And ultimately, in this film, it helps us keep it all straight because there's a lot, a lot to take in. Um, this one's probably a little lesser known. It, it's a, a newer film. Highly recommend on Netflix. I really fell in love with the color. Uh, it's called The Wonder. Uh, it takes place in a remote village in 1862 Ireland where the townsfolk believe a miracle has occurred. Um, and uh, the townsfolk have uh, Florence Pooh's character come out uh, to their town to verify the miracle. And what she finds is a teeny tiny farming community like devastated by, you know, weather and lack of access to any resources. And they harbor a lot of superstitions about religion and whatnot. Um, what I love about the color here is what it does for the mood and tone. The way the grading's been done, the look is very devastating and bleak, and it makes it hard to believe that a miracle could possibly have occurred in this place because it is literally the worst place you would ever want to live. No one would want to live here. Um, and this look helps the narrative because it sows doubt into the audience, and that dovetails nicely into what the main character 
um, believes, because she also doubts the veracity of the miracle. Um, and then through the film, although most of it's bleak and cold, like the images you're seeing here, there are sparse moments of joy for her character, and those correlate with the few warm and rich scenes that we actually get during the movie. There's like three of them. Uh, the rest, it's this the rest of the time. Um, uh, and a filmmaker I wanted to mention is Wong Kar Wai. Um, he's known for his highly visual and emotionally resonant work. And one of the reasons that for, for that reputation is that he has a very strong and intentional focus on color as a, as a storytelling device. Um, many times he has his characters bathed in specific hues of colored light, and those colors often adhere to our collective psychological association of hues, you know? So, you know, red will symbolize passion, lust, love, um, and green, jealousy, and yellows. Um, and then, you know, blues and pale blues for loneliness and longing and white for mourning. Uh, it's cool to see a director be so focused on color as a storytelling element because oftentimes it's sort of a secondary consideration and it's usually the DP's uh, responsibility to think about it. Um, but there, there are several directors that color is a primary uh, tool in their kit for telling the story. Um, and then this film is uh, 2046, um, and nearly every shot in the film is a work of art, so highly recommend. Um, so that's all great. How to implement any of this knowledge, uh, where to start. Um, so I've got three sneaky secrets every DP doesn't want you to know. <laughs> um, so here's the three directives uh, that I have to help you begin to consider color as a storytelling tool. Um, so the first one is start with the journey. Um, it's like Jason was saying, the broad strokes of your color grade are the most important to start with first. You don't want to jump into the specific details of doing beauty work or power windows and all of that until you figured out this stuff. So the journey, where do you want your characters to start and where do you want them to end? Um, what does their internal world look like in the beginning versus the culmination of their arc? Um, in my way of doing this is I put myself in the character's mindset. You know, it's a little bit of acting 101 kind of thing where it's like, all right, I'm the main character. You know, what does my world feel like? You know, what does it feel like to me emotionally? Like if I hate my job and I'm working in a fluorescent lit cubicle office, like, what's the worst version of that? You know, what's the, that really hits home on how I feel? Um, and that's how I'll grade the, grade the scenes. And then you think about the end, like what, what, you know, emotion are we gonna leave this character with and how do they see the world at the end of the film? Because that is exactly how the audience should see the world. So you have to be able to answer that question. Um, and this is all for narrative, for commercials, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> it does, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, so my next point here is uh, break it down per scene. So I think about every scene sort of, I, I have my overall, what the character starts with, what they end with, and then per scene I'm thinking about the deviation from that. Um, the character's journey is rarely linear. Uh, it's really, it's a stock market graph. It's going up and down, um, and it's important to ride those peaks and valleys with the grade. Uh, a lot of the times, especially if you're sort of a, a you know, a perfectionist uh, filmmaker, you know, the best uh, intentions can lead to smoothing everything out so that everything is linear, and I think that makes for a boring watch. In looking at the films that I mentioned earlier, if you actually just look at the thumbnails of the entire project, you'll see that there are very, very heavily contrasted scenes right next to each other. It'll go from a scene that's nearly all blue with nothing else to a scene that's all uh, tungsten orange with nothing else. Um, that's good. That's diversity is the spice of life. Make your scenes diverse and make your scenes contrast. Um, so as we're going through the trials and tribulations of your characters, think about how you can dram dramatize those mood and tone and emotion shifts in between scenes. Um, 
Yeah, and and really like the way you get there is you ask what are your characters feeling, and that should be the priority for color in every scene. <clears throat> okay, and then lastly, don't be afraid to be bold. The surest way to be forgotten as a filmmaker is to blend right in. We are an industry that's uh, where being stylistically bold is rewarded over and over again. So be bold. Uh, as art artists, <clears throat> we all um, tend to pull back to reduce, play it safe, smooth out the wrinkles, get rid of the texture. Um, and this, this isn't the time. Uh, all the films I showed you have very bold color, very memorable, even all the way back to um, The Wizard of Oz. The audience came for a symphony. They want to experience a visceral reaction. Um, and so don't be afraid to dial it up to an 11. Thank you. Um. Please thank Ryan.